Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this online briefing on the war around Nagorno-Karabakh. My name is Walter Kaufmann. I am the head of the Department for Eastern and Southeastern Europe at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict that goes back at least into the 80s, if not into the 20s of the 20th century, has been simmering for 26 years since a ceasefire agreement signed on May 5th in 94 ended the last war with periodic escalations on a smaller scale. Since September 27th, the conflict has returned into a full-fledged war. We are witnessing a massive military offensive on Nagorno-Karabakh by the Azerbaijani side. We have also seen drone and rocket attacks both on Armenia and on Azerbaijan outside the immediate conflict zone. We hear about many victims among the civilian population on both sides and about refugees fleeing the conflict zone. And we hear how, about the heavy political and also more controversial military involvement of neighboring outside powers, first of all, Turkey and Russia. Why has this conflict after 26 years of OSCE mediation returned into open military confrontation? Why now? What is actually happening on the ground? What is different both compared to the war in the beginning of the 90s and from sporadic and compared to sporadic escalations over the last years? What is the role of Turkey and of Russia in the current escalation? And what scenarios seem possible? What could and should external actors do? How to intervene to stop the fighting? I am glad to welcome to this panel Mrs. Aicha Ergun. She's an assistant professor for sociology at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. She has done, she has done among many other topics, a lot of research on questions of identity construction, civil society development, transformation, etc., in Azerbaijan and the South Caucasus region. Then I welcome Lawrence Burrs. Lawrence is the Caucasus program director at London-based peacebuilding organization, Conciliation Resources. He has more than 20 years experience as a researcher on, of conflicts in the South Caucasus and practitioner of peacebuilding initiatives in the region. Lawrence is also the author of the book, Armenia and Azerbaijan, Anatomy of a Rivalry, which was published last year. And last but not least, my colleague, Stefan Meister, He's the head of our South Caucasus Regional Office in Belize, Georgia. Stefan is a political analyst with extensive experience and lots of publications on international affairs, Russia's domestic and foreign policy, Eastern Europe policy of Germany, and many other issues. Before we start our panel, let me just make a few technical remarks. We will try to give you in the next 55 minutes as much as possible in-depth information on the current situation and its background. You are invited to pose your questions via the Q&A function. Your questions will be sorted and clustered by my colleague Katja Giebel here from the Bell Foundation in Berlin. After around 35 minutes, I will invite Katja to read out the questions and we will try to answer at least some of them. Important remark, we will select only questions asking for clarification and further information, no statements. Well, having said this, I would like now to give the floor to Lawrence Bruce. Lawrence, what had to happen that after 26 years of an unstable but long lasting armistice, the conflict turned back into war? Lawrence, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Walter, and thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak uh, on this panel. Uh, as you noted in your introduction, uh, this uh, current iteration of Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict has 
uh, been going on for uh, nearly, uh, for over three decades, it's now in its fourth decade. Um, over that time, the peace process mediated by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, and its Minsk group has been continuous, um, but although there were active periods uh, in the late 1990s and at the turn of the century, uh, mediation has been rather hollowed out uh, by a lack of attention uh, by Euro-Atlantic powers. Periodic escalations temporarily focus minds on the conflict, but there is a recurring pattern uh, of defaulting back to neglect uh, and leaving Russia effectively uh, in the lead. Uh, President Dmitry Medvedev led the last big push uh, in 2011, uh, which ended without success at a summit in the Russian city uh, of Kazan. And this has left Azerbaijan in particular uh, disillusioned uh, with diplomacy. Uh, and it's important to recognize that many uh, in Azerbaijan perceive the Minsk process as eventually leading to uh, a legal ratification uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh separation uh, if the process is successful. Uh, yet the longer the process goes on, the more <laughs> Armenian control over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh that the surrounding uh, occupied territories is increasingly uh, embedded. These were not part of the original territorial dispute that emerged uh, in 1988 and were populated almost entirely by ethnic Azerbaijanis. And so the indefinite uh, postponement and procrastination of the process actually makes the return of these territories uh, and the displaced communities uh, from them uh, appear ever uh, less likely. Destabilizing uh, the line of contact uh, has consequently been seen as uh, the only way to gain leverage uh, over this situation. And over the last six years, uh, we've seen a, a generalized climate uh, of insecurity uh, along the line of contact, dramatically narrowing the space uh, for talks. Uh, after a, a four day war in April, 2016, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan agreed under OSCE mediation to a number of measures to strengthen the ceasefire and to move to more substantive talks, uh, but none of these uh, were implemented. In April, 2018, uh, Armenia witnessed a bloodless velvet revolution, uh, bringing opposition activist Nikol Pashinyan uh, to power, and there were expectations of a reset uh, in the peace process, uh, particularly uh, in Azerbaijan, largely due to the fact that unlike his two predecessors, Nikol Pashinyan was not from Nagorno-Karabakh uh, itself. In September 2018, uh, Nikol Pashinyan and President Ilham Aliyev uh, agreed to reinstate a hotline uh, across the conflict divide and to cooperate on humanitarian issues. And uh, 2019 was actually uh, one of the quietest, if not the quietest year on record in terms of ceasefire violations and casualties. However, political relations began to sour uh, in mid-2019 after an ill-advised speech uh, by Nikol Pashinyan in Stepanakert, the capital uh, of the territory uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, evoking the unity uh, of Armenia and Karabakh. Various other developments, such as a green light given to a third road, connecting Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh across the occupied territories also had inflammatory effects. These tensions surfaced uh, in a significant escalation in July of this year uh, in the area of the international border, uh, killing 17 people, uh, in, um, most of them uh, Azerbaijanis. Uh, unprecedented public protest followed uh, in Azerbaijan in support of military action uh, ensued in, in the Azerbaijani capital. And there were also more explicit pledges of Turkish support. Uh, these are not new, but perhaps more forthcoming in the aftermath of the July escalation, intensified contacts uh, between defense officials, uh, between uh, the two countries and Turkish politicians openly voiced threats uh, to uh, Armenia. Uh, the onset of uh, uh, arms uh, of military uh, action on the 27th of September comes at a time of great global distraction uh, with the US elections, Belarus protests, the pandemic, uh, and so on. And fighting has now gone on for uh, some two weeks. Um, it's clear that uh, the military goal appears to be to recapture or to liberate from Baku's perspective, uh, significantly larger part, uh, areas of territory uh, than in April, 2016. Uh, the focus appears to have been along the Southern flank uh, in the direction of Fizuli and Jebrail, uh, to the south of the former Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. These are lower lying areas uh, which were won or occupied 
uh, by Armenian forces in 1993 without uh, a fight. Uh, there also appears to have been an Azerbaijani advance to the northeast, uh, recapturing uh, areas uh, around the villages of Talish uh, and Madagiz. Uh, in all probability, it seems reasonable to assume that perhaps close to a thousand people have been killed uh, in action. Uh, and this is an attrition rate comparable to the worst period of fighting uh, in the 1990s between January and April uh, 1994. It's just taken two weeks to get to that level of attrition. Uh, more than 50 civilians uh, have been killed so far. Uh, and as Walter mentioned, there have been missile strikes and bombardments of population points in Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, beyond the line of contact on the Azerbaijani side. President Putin has convened talks today uh, in Moscow, and there are rumors uh, flying around uh, that there may be uh, a possible truce. Uh, that does not mean a ceasefire, of course. And so it seems that the questions as of today are uh, what incentives do the parties have to agree to a ceasefire or to continue fighting? What leverage do outside powers have to enforce a ceasefire? And will international action to address a post ceasefire situation be dominated by a multilateral coalition within the framework of OSE mediation or a regionalized Russian-Turkish duopoly. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Maybe you allow me one more question. What, what has changed militarily um, in comparison to, to the war of the 90s? We have a completely different technological level yeah, of armament and of, um, yeah. It yeah. has changed well, the situation significantly, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Well, uh, we also have uh, significantly uh, more professional uh, armies uh, fighting uh, on, on the ground, as opposed to the much more disorganized, uh, often paramilitary units fighting uh, in the early 1990s. And we have a, a 21st century contest, in a sense, between uh, aerial attrition uh, through the use of Turkish uh, and Israeli drones uh, versus uh, terrestrial control uh, by Armenian uh, forces on the ground. Uh, and so I think there's quite a, a prospect in a sense of a stalemate, um, particularly if fighting extends to more highland areas uh, where defensive positions may be more difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to, to counter. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the media coverage has been dominated by uh, these, the reports, uh, many different reports, uh, independent reports of the use of Syrian, mis uh, Syrian mercenaries uh, in the conflict uh, context. Uh, also allegations of, of Armenian volunteers moving uh, from other, uh, co other countries into uh, the, the, the combat zone, although these are probably not mercenaries uh, as such. Um, but clearly um, uh, the use of drones, I think, has had a qualitative difference. Uh, uh, on, on the conflict, and Azerbaijan has succeeded uh, in achieving uh, what it couldn't achieve uh, in April 2016. If you recall, uh, in that fighting, a number of Armenian positions were overrun in the initial uh, operation, which were then recaptured. Uh, but I would say that the situation is very fluid. Uh, it's too early to speculate uh, on definitive military outcomes on the ground. Mm. Well, thank you. Hi, Chair Ergun. Um, as Lawrence has mentioned already, we were used to um, political support uh, for its sister nation, Azerbaijan, by Turkey. What we were not very much used to was this kind of open support for military action, um, as now kind of provided by or announced by, by President Erdogan and the Turkish government. What has changed on the Turkish side and what is the public perception and reaction in Turkey on this Karabakh conflict? Well, uh, armies start saying that nothing has changed, but uh, most of the things have been deepened. Uh, I will start by a short background of the nature of the Azerbaijani-Turkish relations, bilateral relations since the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And we could easily say that the Turkish both Turkey and Azerbaijan, they kind of attribute a quite a prestigious status to each other. So in this respect, the bilateral relationship between Azerbaijan and Turkey is quite exceptional. In the early stages of the post-Soviet period, this is largely informed by the cultural, ethnic, religious, and linguistic affinities 
but also, I mean, strongly informed by the fact that Turkey denied to establish diplomatic relations with Armenia unless the peaceful co resolution of the conflict uh, will be done in favor of Azerbaijan. So basically, this is kind of a rather um, a very important kind of a move by the Turkish government, and this is highly appreciated and still appreciated by the all Azerbaijani governments since the beginning uh, of the for, uh, since the collapse of the former Soviet Union. So that's why it's not only the affinities, cultural, linguistic, historical, religious affinities that are tidying up these countries, both countries together but rather uh, Turkey's political and moral support to Azerbaijan provided since the uh, early years of the independence period. Uh, I mean, these affinities have been backed up through time by pragmatic choices and overlapping of the interest, particularly in the projects of transportation and energy. So basically we could easily say that this emotional uh, commonality has been replaced over time by initiating joint projects which are of the economic and political value for both countries. So basically, uh, and moreover, we can easily say that uh, all types of relationship between two governments have been institutionalized. So basically, that's what we can kind of uh, say in terms of the nature of the relationship. And the motto of the One Nation, Two States have been, uh, has been popularly used by all political elites in uh, both parties. However, what's important in this kind of, in the nature of the relationship is the significance of the public opinion. So basically, public opinion in both countries, without question, support each other, uh, acknowledge each other's value, and consider uh, each other as the, not only the best friends, uh, but also brothers and sisters, as well as the strategic partners. So basically, there are like three dimensions, like, you know, the commonality exemplified by the brotherhood and sisterhood, and strategic partnership by intensification of the relationship and overlapping of the interest of both parties in the region. And the public opinion uh, is co quite supporting the political elite choices and preferences. So basically, I think what is important here is not only the choices and the preferences of the political elites on both parties, but also the significant support on part of the public opinion, both in Turkey and in Azerbaijan. I mean, recent studies uh, which have been repeated quite frequently in terms of the perceptions of uh, within Turkish foreign policy, identify the polls actually each year identifies Azerbaijan as the best ally best friend, best brother, and best sister. So basically, this is the background, I guess, for the nature of the relationship. But I would say, or I would repeat, what I said at the beginning is that we can easily say that the deepening of these relations uh, in an exceptional way. I would like to focus uh, like two aspects of this deepening of the relations. Uh, why, and try to also answer the question of why now? And what, why not, what not before? So basically, I would say that the Azerbaijani, I mean, the war option was always on the table. So it's not something new in this respect. But I would say that the Azerbaijani side uh, acquired an opportunity structure, which, were, which is informed by a number of factors. One is, as I said earlier, war was an option, is an option, and was an option all the time. Uh, Azerbaijan Institute and the Azerbaijani military has been consolidated quite well in the last 25 years and became kind of a much more powerful. Uh, Azerbaijan lost faith into the international community and the non-implementation of the UN resolutions. Uh, and obviously Russia withdrew its support from Armenia, probably testing its loyalty to Russia compared to the pro kind of a Western explanations of so I think it was a very good opportunity structure for Azerbaijan to initiate uh, a move in order to liberate the occupied territories. So basically, um, and obviously, I mean, I would say that obviously both parties, they are both parties meaning Russia and Turkey, they were quite informed prior 
to the uh, to this move. So basically, it is kind of expected in a way. So basically, it was always expected, but I mean, it was a question of time and it was a question of the opportunity structure. So basically, um, that is what I will say in terms of this. What is the role for Turkey in this conflict? I mean, we can say that Turkey, uh, apart from the fact that the Turkish government and Turkish public opinion supported uh, Azerbaijani cause in many ways, in many platforms, in, term, in regional and international organizations, etc. I think there is this question of the deepening of the relationship. And I think uh, Turkey wants to become a prominent regional security actor in the region. So basically, uh, that's why it attributes itself a kind of a more proactive role uh, in the in the process and as well as it seems that as well as in the conflict resolution because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Medi uh recently argued, stated that actually uh, Turkey not only will support Azerbaijan in the field, but also in the table, which is actually again voiced by the representatives of the Azerbaijani government saying that they first saying that they want to see Turkey on the table uh, in a would be peace talks, it, if it will be the case, uh, and they would like to ha they would like to have Turkey on the table. Okay. So I mm -hmm. think I can mm -hmm. stop here. Thank you very much. This would mean this is um, also the existing mediation format is being challenged by Azerbaijan, saying that it must be changed. Uh, Turkey needs a place at the table uh, and. Um, other question that of course comes up is that the question of active um, participation of military personnel from, from Turkey in the actual fightings. Um, this is something that has been blamed by the Armenian side uh, and um, has been figuring in, in the different uh, researches, reports of journalists. What is, what, what is the kind of discourse on that in, in Turkey? Well, the discourse in Turkey uh, is that they, they provide the political and moral support to Azerbaijani government, and there is no such Turkish military involvement uh, in the operations. But on the other hand, and this is also confirmed by the Azerbaijani government. So, and I think, I mean, uh, Turkey does not, or Azerbaijan does not, does not need Turkish personnel to be military officers in the field because, I mean, because of a number of reasons. So basically, uh, Azerbaijani military officers, they have been trained in Turkey for many years now. So basically, they have the, they went to the military schools and they have the previous experience of kind of uh, initiating and implementing joint military exercises. So basically, they have, the, there is a generation of military officers in both parties who were possibly being classmates 20 years ago and now kind of a, because of the fact that they are studied in Turkey so basically there is this generation of the military officers in Turkey who closely uh, sorry in Azerbaijan who closely work with the Turkish ones so basically that's why I don't think that the Azerbaijani military or the government needs extra Turkish military personnel in the field. Stefan, <clears throat> um, we were used uh, to Russia holding the role of the kind of primus inter pares among the mediators uh, in the Minsk group um, and um, maintaining control of the situation by both um, maintaining good relations with uh, Azerbaijan and at the same time being perceived as the main strategic and security partner of Armenia. Um, by the way, delivering weapons and armament to both sides. Um, what has changed? Has Russia lost control? Stefan? Thank you, Walter, for this question. Um, I also want to thank in the beginning. Um, yeah? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I also want to thank colleagues in, um, in Berlin and in Tbilisi for, for setting up this very short um, uh, short time event um, and we really had the impression there's a need for information but also I think it is very important to have attention on this conflict because of the uh, level of escalation we have in the neighborhood of the EU 
um, and also the spillover, the possible spillover effects uh, to other countries which have both uh, minorities from Armenia um, and, and Azerbaijan. And I'm at the moment in, in Georgia, this is one of the countries which has minorities from both countries. And I think this is really, really, really dangerous also, yeah, what's going on here. And I think we, we cannot just uh, look or observe what is, what is, going, what is going on here. Um, as it has been said, I think, in my opinion, um, Turkey has changed the rules of the game. Um, and maybe it's not directly military engaging in this conflict, but I, uh, I think in terms of training, in terms of maybe also technical personnel, um, in terms of uh, um, uh, supporting mer mercenaries, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it is uh, strengthening this uh, approach of, of Azerbaijan to, um, uh, to, to that they can win this war. Yeah, and I think this is, this is a very, very difficult, a very dangerous perception. Um, looking to Russia, um, I, I would like to question the narrative why Turkey is the ally of Azerbaijan, uh, Russia is the ally of Armenia. Uh, and I think Walter already made this point, uh, Russia has always developed good relations with both countries, it sells weapons to both of them. Azerbaijan gets more advanced weapons uh, for market price, uh, while Armenia gets less topical weapons for discount um, as a member of uh, the regional security organization, ODKB. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and um, Russia has used this conflict in the last uh, decades to keep both countries dependent and it never supported only one side. If we remember how this conflict started, I think uh, the Soviet side or Russian side supported more Azerbaijan than, than, than Armenia. Uh, yeah, but it is, it, it is using this conflict for its purposes, like maybe also Turkey is doing so. Um, yes, Russia has a military base uh, in the second largest town or city of um, Armenia in Gumri, uh, but um, Russian military play more a role of containment um, to focus on Iran and Turkey, um, then that they should be involved in fights with, uh, with uh, um, Azerbaijan and Karabakh. So I think their, their main purpose there was a different one. They are more deployed to the border to Turkey and Iran than to, this, to, the, to the border to, to, to Karabakh or, or um, Azerbaijan. And, and sure, they should keep also the balance for for, for a weaker um, um, Armenia, yeah, in, 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 the, in the last years. This was the idea of Russia, yeah. Um, in my opinion, this collective security treaty organization, or ODKB, is more a Patyomkin or institution or organization than a functioning security organization like NATO with Article 5. Um, ODKB involvement in a conflict is very complicated, but would anyway only be relevant if Armenia is attacked. Yeah, Karabakh is not part of Armenia officially, and therefore it's not part of this treaty. Yeah, um, and at the same time, I cannot imagine that Central Asian member states of ODKB or Belarus will support Armenia in a war against Azerbaijan. So it's really up to Russia to make here um, decisions. And I think uh, looking to this um, um, escalation, we have to understand Russian rationale, Russian logic also. Uh, of, of uh, looking into, the, uh, into this region. I also believe that Russia was not completely surprised by this attack. Yeah, so it, it, it has been somehow informed and it also has seen the preparations um, for this attack. But I think it was somehow involved by the, um, um, it was somehow surprised by the, by, the, by the timing maybe, but also by the Turkish involvement. Yeah, and by the size of the Turkish involvement and also the Turkish side fooling rhetorically, but also somehow militarily this, uh, this conflict. And I think this, this changes also the cost benefit calculations um, of the Russian side. So it has to recalculate somehow um, its, its role um, at, at the moment. So and I think there's no consensus in the Russian elite to fight a war against Azerbaijan because of Armenia. I think this is definitely clear, yeah? Moscow would, would need to bring heavy weapons and more troops into the region. It, it wants to interfere into this conflict which is very costly and very difficult. It cannot go through Georgia. Uh, Georgian government will not accept this. So that means it has to go via Iran, yeah, which is, which is quite tricky. Um, and I think there's no, no reason for such an engagement at the moment. Um, the troops in Gyumri are not prepared, as I said, for a war with Azerbaijan. And it would not be accepted by Russian society that Russian soldiers would die in such a war. So I think this is not an option, I just wanted to say. Azerbaijan and Turkey are not enemies um, of Russia. In the opposite, the Aliyev uh, leadership is by its authoritarian nature much closer to the Putin system than Nikol Pashinyan's government. 
um, yeah, so um, uh, this would be also somehow problematic. Russian leadership was from the beginning skeptical about Pashinyan, who came to power by, by grassroots street, streets protests. So this is not like uh, Putin likes that someone comes to power. We can see it also in, uh, in Belarus at the moment. Even if Nikol Pashinyan shows his loyalty towards Russia, the democratization of Ar Armenia is in long term a problem for, for the Kremlin. Yeah? Um, so in Russian leadership is not happy with the Armenian side who has from their perspective blocked a solution or solution options of solution of the conflict when it was possible some years ago. Um, yeah, so there's also kind of a now, yeah, frustration is maybe too much to say, but um, yeah, so they, they are not very happy with this policy. And even worse, I think Russia also understands that its presence in Armenia was keeping the balance and there was no sense of urgency for the Armenian leaders to make compromises towards um, Azerbaijan. Um, and for Russia, it is understandable and, ex uh, understandable and acceptable if Azerbaijan takes back by force the seven provinces around Nagorno-Karabakh and then um, have negotiations on the status quo of Karabakh as long as it does not touch Armenia. Yeah? Um, so I think there is a kind of flexibility also from the Russian side to get maybe here some, some changes in this conflict. Key for Russia um, is that there's no Western US involvement in this conflict. This is different to Georgia, yeah, 2008. It can live with much better if, with a Turkish role, but as long as the US is disengaged, which is also the case, there's no sense of urgency to act for Moscow. Um, as I said, I like it was with Georgia. Um, so in Russian leadership focus on the, on the US might, uh, uh, might have also underestimated of the role of Turkey. Yeah, um, so, and, and I think this, this reshuffling also, and I think the Turkish side is also using this conflict maybe to get a bargain, better bargaining position in Syria and in Libya. Um, yeah, but I think um, from, from a Russian side, just to end, end up uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this answer, I think um, there is a new, there's somehow a new game there, there, there is not really attack on Armenia, but the fights are focused on Karabakh. I think this is really crucial, um, and uh, and uh, Russia will not really directly engage in this war. It's 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 too costly. Um, so it's now the question uh, under which conditions Russia will then provide the platform to negotiate between both. I think this is how Putin sees himself, and as I said, Russia can also accept if if Azerbaijan gains some territory. Uh, for instance, of this of this seven provinces. So, from a Russian perspective, yeah, it's not a big problem. Even if uh, even if um, the, yeah, even if the game is now somehow different one, it's still able to negotiate with Erdogan and and with both of, with both leaders. Thank you, Stefan. So, if I count together what has been said, I must say the prospects for the Armenian position seem to be rather bleak at the moment. Um, so there seems to be a, um, it seems to be dependent on a Russian Turkish deal or Russian Turkish negotiations um, and both are not the closest friends to say the, the least um, of the Pashinyan government. Maybe we look take a look now into um, the questions that have come in and then we continue with discussing um, implications for a way out um, and for further scenarios. Katya, would you like um, to present to us? Hello, Katya. Hi. Yeah, hello. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon also from my side. Many thanks to all speakers for your contributions. I'm, I'm glad there's quite an interest in the topic. We are now about 145 attendees um, here together. And yeah, I tried now to to pick some of the questions from the audiences. Let's start uh, with a general questions addressed to all speakers uh, from Seville Kusenova. She's asking how long can both sides fight with such intensity without direct intervention from third countries? What are the resources of both sides? And uh, maybe we directly pick up some more questions. There was many on the role of Turkey um, Susan Reiner asks, what is known about the military equipment that was left by Turkey in Azerbaijan after the joint military ex exercises this summer? Um, 
Also, Ani Matifosian wants to know um, from Aicha Ergun, you said that the political decisions from Turkey and Azerbaijan reflect the public opinion. Are you saying that both countries have legitimate governance and that it completely shows the opinions of their citizens? And question number two, do you claim that public opinion in both countries, in Turkey and Azerbaijan, is uh, too hostile? is hostile to Armenia and, Armen and uh, Armenians. And um, also, also um, there was one more question on this topic, or maybe we, we start answering what we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katja. Um, <clears throat> how long can this fighting still last? What are the resources, Lawrence? What do you think um, will the sites exhaust their resources very soon, or can this go on for months to come? Um, I, I would, I would say that at this level of intensity, that what we've been seeing over the last two weeks, um, I would, I would say that that could not be sustained for uh, uh, a long period. Um, but uh, I think a low intensity uh, kind of protracted standoff um, with, uh, you know, using, uh, using drones and, and sort of uh, constant skirmishes, uh, I think could be sustained uh, for, for quite some time. So I think the key is what would be the motives and incentives uh, for the parties to agree to a ceasefire. Uh, have Azerbaijani advances uh, into the occupied territories been sufficient uh, for uh, Azerbaijan to feel that it can come back into uh, a negotiations process, which, as we've heard, it doesn't have much confidence in, um, from a strengthened uh, position? Uh, does, uh, has uh, Armenian military performance uh, been sufficient for Nikol Pashinyan to be able to claim that a very heavy price has been exacted uh, for uh, the um, uh, for the uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for for the recapture uh, of those territories um, and would anything substantive change in terms of the strategic outlook? Um, I mean, I think things have changed uh, certainly politically. Uh, for all the reasons that we've been discussing in terms of uh, uh, Turkey's contributed input uh, and uh, increased Azerbaijani confidence. Um, but I think, you know, uh, we are seeing um, uh, outside actors uh, kind of mobilizing, uh, starting to pay more attention. Uh, I think we will see more intensive uh, diplomatic efforts uh, in the coming days. So I think what we might see is a spike in fighting prior to uh, a ceasefire being being agreed, um, uh, or we could see a sort of a more protracted uh, conflict ongoing for, for for potentially several weeks. I don't think that we'll see uh, this level of intensity uh, over a protracted period because the, the costs are, are, are too high. This is affecting every family uh, in in Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan. Mm. Maybe I add the question on on. <clears throat> the kind of mediation that can or could take place. Yeah? Will it be a bilateral mediation or kind of bilateral deal uh, between Turkey and Russia, kind of regional setting? Or what are the chances left for a multilateral approach? How do you assess this? Well, I think it's um, too early to write off uh, the Minsk group. Uh, I think there are considerable risks, uh, both for Armenia and Azerbaijan of a kind of a, a great power pact uh, or a kind of a geopolitical deal-making scenario that would be very much a top-down uh, kind of conflict management uh, arrangement. Uh, both Russia and Turkey are invested in authoritarian models uh, of managing conflict. Um, and uh, as has been noted, uh, Turkey's entry into the South Caucasus uh, suggests that this becomes part of uh, a wider spectrum uh, of regional conflict theatres where Russia and Turkey are engaged some of the time as rivals backing different parties on the ground and sometimes as a kind of pragmatic partners working to exclude 
uh, the influence uh, of other actors and particular uh, Euro uh, Atlantic actors. So, you know, there's a, there's a possibility of a kind of a grand bargain, um, but I doubt that Armenians and Azerbaijanis would be at the table uh, for such a, a grand bargain. The flip side of that uh, is that uh, in Li Libya and Syria, uh, Turkey and Russia have been backing uh, vulnerable factions uh, engaged in very protracted, very violent, destructive civil wars. Uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan are recognized states. They have their populations behind them and their leaders uh, have mandates to rule. Uh, so they may be less vulnerable to external leverage uh, than, uh, than the parties supported by Russia and Turkey uh, in, in Syria and Libya. So this idea of a bargain, I think, has, has some problems. Uh, but an awful lot depends on the extent to which European powers and the US re-engage with this uh, actively and remain focused on it beyond the point where the guns are still firing, which they have failed to do in the past. Thank you. This is a point for you to come in, Stefan. European powers coming in. What are the chances? I just wanted to add to what uh, Lauren said. Um, I think it's, for me, it's somehow problematic to see this as a great power game. Um, and, and yes, sure, Turkey is, um, is coming in and, and uh, there will be negotiations between Turkey and Russia, which are the, the key players on the ground. But um, I think this is still an Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, um, uh, which is very much uh, driven also uh, uh, from both sides. You, you have both countries uh, uh, had nation buildings, uh, nation building also with this conflict um, uh, and with the enemy of the other. So just to have an agreement between um, uh, Russia and Turkey, I think will not be enough. Uh, and also as Lawrence mentioned it, um, it's, it's also uh, about what, what can, so what gains do they have? How they can, both leaders can go into these negotiations um, and sell that they have not lost. Yeah, so it's also about their political survival um, uh, to, to uh, how these negotiations will go on. So I think it's much more difficult for Turkey and for, 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 for Russia just to agree um, and they have to be involved. So I think this is, this is really maybe different to many other conflicts uh, we have um, and we should not see this too strong to this, this uh, lens. Um, coming back to your question, um, I think also a major problem is the disengagement, the disengagement of the US, the dis disengagement of the, of the Euro Europeans or the EU and, mem and member states. Yes, France is a co-chair of the Minsk group, um, but uh, France is also not seen from the Azeri side as an honest bargainer, yeah, with, with its uh, Armenian uh, mi minority. And it was not really, so I think my impression was also the US, the US and France, they gave this conflict to Russia mainly as, um, as the key co-chair of, uh, of the Minsk group. And, and, um, and I think that's really problematic. Um, uh, uh, and also, as, as it was mentioned, uh, the way how Russia is dealing with conflicts, um, it is not having an interest in solving a conflict, but using a conflict for its own interests and purposes. And I think there's a lack of an honest partner. And I think, uh, I think there, it would make sense from my perspective to have a European engagement here. So if we take our neighborhood serious or as a European Union, as Germany, um, we have to engage more in this conflict. We have to create um, um, a kind of a, maybe not alternative platform, but link it with the, with the Minsk um, platform. Yeah, I think OSCE is, is a key um, multilateral institutions. We are supporting multilateralism yeah, in, in, in the world. It's, it's crucial to the Europeans. So I think we need a re-engagement here from the European side and, and, and have this kind of a platform where, where, where are, um, players who have really an interest in, in, in support solving or at least uh, yeah, have, a, have a kind of a, not only ceasefire, but, but, but better solution for the, for the conflict we have now. Yeah, thank you. Aja, there was the question about the legitimacy um, of um, authoritarian leaders uh, um, in both Azerbaijan and Turkey, and how is it affected um, by the conflict? And that there was the, the role, I don't know how, to what extent you can give an answer about military equipment left in Azerbaijan after the exercise. Okay. No, it's okay, I guess. Okay, I'd like to start by commenting on the possible scenarios of the conflict resolution. 
uh, there is a very common kind of um, concept used uh, in order to define the relationship between Russia and Turkey, that is the competitive cooperation or the competitive partnership. Uh, and I guess uh, in the would be peace talks, we don't necessarily know the content and the nature of the competitiveness or the partnership. So, so basically, obviously, it seems as of today, the Russian and Turkish involvement will be there for sure. But uh, in terms of the European involvement, uh, obviously, EU should definitely question the presence of France in the OSCE Minsk group, particularly this has been challenged quite as Lauren said, by the Azerbaijani side. So I think uh, this restoration of trust and restor restoration of the credibility on part of the European institutions are quite crucial here. Because sitting, uh, forming up a, of a table with Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey and Russia is not at all an easy task. So basically, there has to be some international involvement on part of particularly the EU and perhaps the US uh, to be in the peace talk. And there was this question about uh, how, how, how I would know that the public opinion supports the choices of the political leaders. So the, the nature of the Azerbaijani-Turkish relations is not new and the exceptional nature uh, does not necessarily pop up in the last 10 days. So basically the separate analysis of the discourses of the political elite in both countries and discourses, our perceptions within the public opinion uh, have shared the commonalities quite well in terms of friendship, brotherhood, sisterhood, partnership, etc. So basically, it's, it's not at all an exaggeration to say that the public opinion in both countries strongly supports, like, lo even love each other in this respect. So basically, uh, so this is not something new. And I would definitely argue for the overlapping uh, uh, of the perceptions or the discourses and practices of the political elites and the perceptions of the public opinion in both levels. Was there any other question? Uh, on, on military equipment, but I, I'm well, I read the news too. I read yeah. the news too, but I mean, uh, because of the fact that, I mean, this has been denied on both governments, uh, I wouldn't consider myself to make a comment on this. So basically, uh, as I said earlier, what is important is not uh, the real presence of Turkish military officers in Azerbaijani territory, which is denied by Turkish and Azerbaijani governments. But I mean, they invested and they trained the Azerbaijani military officers and they, they're collaborating for the last 10 years, working together, studying together, even socializing together uh, for the last 30 years. So basically, uh, I don't mm -hmm. think that neither of the parties will need, need this. Thank you. I would like to manage as a short second round of questions. Um, Katya, for the last 10 minutes, um, yes, what um, questions have you found? I mean, there's many questions also on the historical background of the conflict. So I picked the one from Anna Pereira um, addressed to Stefan. Could Bistermeister elaborate on Nagorno-Karabakh as an autonomous region in Soviet era and why now most analysts take starting point of the conflict as in 1988 and um, see Nagorno-Karabakh region as a part of Azerbaijan? So this on the one hand. Um, uh, also, there is questions who want to know, who ask for more in detail on, on the role of um, external ac uh, actors. So, for example, from Noda Itza Dashvili, she's a um, stipendiat at HBF now in Berlin. She's asking how can Russia's role in the region and the conflicts be reduced? And on the other hand, how can the re role of the EU be strengthened? I mean, we had, we had it already partly, but maybe even more uh, in detail. And one more question from Sebastian Versig. How could Georgia react on the conflict and what could Georgian government do to, man to maintain peaceful relations among ethnic Armenians and Azerbaijanis living in Georgia? Thank you. Thank you so much. I, Stefan, uh, I hope um, you're not um, kind of reacting negatively. If I, 
direct the question on the Nagorno-Karabakh history to Lawrence as one of the main historians <laughs> in dealing with uh, this conflict. Um, and you then turn on Georgia and uh, Georgia domestically in the role of Georgia, I think this is, and maybe we all end up again by um, the question how to strengthen the role of the EU as we are conducting this discussion from, from Berlin. I think this is also politically very relevant and I would ask you in your final statements, um, maybe come up with some concrete steps that should be taken by the uh, European Union to, to strengthen their uh, its role. Um, Lawrence, the history of the conflict and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as an autonomous region. Um, but maybe you, you just say a few, a few words because I think this is important for the audience. Um, what, what are the kind of compromise solutions that have been closed at some point in the negotiation process? If you look back to Key Biscayne uh, in the beginning of the 2000s, um, what were the kind of basic principles for compromise that have been raised in the, in the process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, very briefly, well, sorry. Yeah, I'll try and keep this very brief and please do interrupt uh, and stop me. Um, yeah, just relative to this question and to the earlier comments, uh, there has been, of course, a lot of emphasis on geopolitics and the role of geopolitical actors. Um, but this is not fundamentally a geopolitical conflict. Uh, it is locally driven. Uh, it's driven by uh, national identities and histories of grievance uh, that go back to 1988 and before that. So, of course, the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region was established uh, in Azerbaijan in 1923. This was actually the product of a previous effort by the Bolsheviks at top-down conflict resolution. Azerbaijan was in control of the territory at the time of its Sovietization, but there was a rebellious Armenian minority that didn't want to be part of Soviet Azerbaijan. And the autonomous region was, in a sense, a, a compromise. Um, it compensated uh, the local Armenian population uh, with autonomy, uh, compensating for the fact that it was now part of, of Soviet Azerbaijan. So yes, for the historical roots to the conflict, one does have to go back to the independence period and the violence uh, at that time. Now, in terms of possible uh, compromises that have been discussed, um, in the late 1990s, there was a, a kind of a discussion of possible uh, so-called package uh, approach that would decide the status of Nagorno-Karabakh up front, or a step-by-step -step approach that deferred that status determination process uh, pending uh, progress on other issues, including uh, withdrawal uh, from, uh, from occupied territories around Nagorno-Karabakh. In, in 1999 to 2001, the idea of a territorial swap was discussed. Um, but in the end, you know, local resistance uh, to that idea uh, was too strong. So that, you know, that really does show how rooted uh, possession of Nagorno-Karabakh is in, in popular uh, sentiments uh, across the divide. The, the current uh, peace proposal, the basic principles or Madrid principles as they're widely known, propose a system of interim, a mechanism of interim status for Nagorno-Karabakh pending a referendum or a, a, a final status vote uh, some stage down the line. Um, and uh, that's regarded as uh, with a lack of confidence uh, by, by both sides. So, you know, I think in terms of where we go from here, uh, we can either have, uh, I think, uh, a, a revived um, Minsk group process uh, with much more energy, uh, uh, perhaps through the convening of uh, the Minsk conference that has been deferred all this time since the early 1990s. The co-chairs have been preparing for it all of this time. Uh, one option would be for Sweden, uh, which is coming in as the chair and office of the OSCE uh, to host uh, this conference uh, in, in Stockholm. Uh, but it's crucial for that, that conference or for any energized process to address the political issues. What we don't want uh, is uh, uh, the, the context of the Geneva international discussions on the conflicts in Georgia, which have basically become just an information sharing platform. We do need uh, a process that moves forward on the political issues and which addresses security. That's the core Armenian demand. Uh, you know, the population in Nagorno-Karabakh has been under sustained bombardment. Uh, half of the population has reportedly left the territory. Uh, so really a very dire 
humanitarian crisis, which I think often the geopolitical uh, framing uh, overlooks. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Hey, Jeff. Just a mute, please. Done. Uh, what I would think that obviously it will be peace talk process was not kind of a, an easy task for any uh, parties, including the third party involvement. However, what I would suggest that is that, I mean, international community, including the OSCE and the UN should go beyond saying that they recognize the territorial integrity uh, of the Azerbaijani state. So basically, as I said earlier, there is this problem of lack of trust and uh, reputation as well, as well as credibility. So they basically are either in the form of the EU or France, Germany or Sweden, uh, whomever will be active in the process, they have to restore uh, the sense of trust, the sense of credibility and the sense of kind of uh, objectiveness on part of the Azerbaijani government. And in this respect, the international community, as I said earlier, should go beyond saying that they recognize the territorial integrity. So basically, in a way, they have to be kind of a more active in this respect. So basically, as I said earlier, I mean, it's not an easy task uh, for the peace talks to happen, but obviously uh, compared to 25 years ago, Azerbaijan became in a more strong and consolidated uh, they will sit in today but in a more consolidated and strong position in a way so basically and they 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 will probably want their kind of a right to be highlighted uh, and underlined by all parties involved in the conflict uh, i must say that i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't i wouldn't rely on the performance of the oasc minsk group and i would kind of suggest that there should be a definite revision of the composition of the Minsk group. I mean, they have to, international community, including the UN and the EU, has to offer something new for the conflict resolution. And this novelty should definitely guarantee peace and stability in the region, but also uh, fairness as well. Thank you, Aicha. Stefan, Georgia, domestically, Armenians and Azeris living in Georgia, maybe two sentences, three sentences. <laughs> And uh, then your final remark. <clears throat> yeah, two points, um, uh, both very short. Um, I think uh, Georgia has good relations with both countries. It is an important transit country um, to, to um, is this the transit country uh, for, for, for Armenia, yeah, to also for, for trade. And it has these pipelines also from Azerbaijan um, uh, to, to Europe. And, and the, the Georgian president also offered a kind of a neutral platform, yeah, for, for negotiations. Uh, but it has not the power yeah, to bring both um, on, on the table. So, but Georgia sees also yeah, its role here with good relationship with, with both countries. Looking to, on the eth ethnic minorities, um, I think it's somehow problematic how Georgia itself deals uh, with these, uh, with these um, both ethnic groups. Um, yeah, it's, um, they are often marginalized um, here in the society. Um, they are economically um, very weak, um, vulnerable. Um, uh, they, um, they are instrumentalized also during the election campaign here in, in, in the country, uh, partly. I, and I think this is, this is for me much more problematic. If they would have been better integrated into the Georgian society, um, this problem or this, this, uh, this question would not be there. Yeah. Um, so if they can somehow get 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 involved, yeah. But I think it's also um, so a failure of the Georgian government or the Georgian state and society to integrate better these two um, ethnic groups, uh, which which have since centuries lived in in Georgia. Yeah, Georgia as a multi a multinational multi multi religious uh, country also. Yeah. So and I think. Um, this blocking of lorries, for instance, of Turkish lorries, yeah, which happened, um, was then got under, somehow under control. But if this further further escalates, I think there is a kind of a, um, a problem also for Georgia, really, yeah, and, and this needs to be faced. Um, I think most of the points have been made. I'm rather skeptical that the Minsk format, how it is now, will will play a major role in, in, uh, in this ceasefire and solving this conflict. I, I just don't think so because it's not accepted anymore from Azerbaijan. And it is, um, there is a kind of, 
um, stalemate and, uh, and and discreditation of, of, of parts of it, yeah, and, and a disengagement. So I, yeah, maybe this new new co-chairs or reshuffling would help, but I also don't think that this will work. So I really, I, I really think it needs maybe an EU initiative um, to create a platform which is linked uh, then with the OSCE um, group because Russia has to be definitely involved, yeah, and also Turkey has to be somehow involved. But you need um, you need a player which has. A, has uh, legitimacy in all countries and is seen as an honest bargainer. Yeah, for instance, like Germany, which has a good image in, in the entire region. Merkel was calling as the first European leader also to both pre presidents or pre one president and the other prime minister. So I think um, I also understand how overstretched the Europeans are with conflicts and especially Germany. Everybody's looking to Germany. But um, I think that would be for me one, one really uh, um, possible option yeah to 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 bring in germany and and the eu in uh, in, in negotiations and creating a new platform which is linked with the minsk format thank you well <clears throat> thank you thank you all um very much um i i'm you so my off video right is, is already ready no no i'm still there <laughs> so um well thank you um dear Aicha, dear Stefan, and dear Lawrence, uh, thank, thank the audience. I'm very impressed that more than 140 uh, people listened to our discussion. I'm sorry that, of course, due to the complexity of the issue, we could not explain all aspects of this complex um, conflict in 60 minutes. I hope that we could help you um, getting some in-depth information. And um, I remain just wishing what I think is the most urgent thing, what is needed. We need sustainable, fair peace for Armenians and for Azeris. Thank you very much and goodbye. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>